Okay, so uh, welcome to the last lecture of this course. You will have other two labs uh, or sort of labs in these on the coming week, but this is the last Tuesday that you have to be here at 8.30 and I also need to be here at 8.30. So we made it, apparently. Um, and today we're going to cover three things. Uh, the first is authentication. It's speaking about authentication from a, let's say, theoretical perspective and also some practical but on slides. Uh, the second thing that we are going to do in the next hour is instead uh, looking at an exercise that uses authentication on both React and Express. And I said looking because we are not going to do the exercise together, uh, but the exercise is already done and it's already on GitHub. Uh, we are just going to comment it step by step as we were doing it together, slowly, if needed. And the exercise this time is already done because it's quite long to be completed if we do everything step by step. Uh, there are some not new parts, like the form for a login, that's a form, as the others that you have created. And there are some prescriptive part on the server that must be done always in the same way so there is nothing really strange uh, once you have seen once it's just copy and paste a reasonable a reason at the copy and paste but it's the same and so since it's the last lecture and we don't have another lecture and you will need to do this in the lab I prefer to um, give the exercise done comment going through it together with you today so that you have the full exercise, all the steps needed for authentication, not only for authenticating user, but also for keeping the user logged in in your application, no matter which operation you will do in the, uh, in the, uh, in the React application. And the third thing is just some five, 10 minutes closing remarks, uh, closing remarks about the course and what you can do after the course, after the exams, clearly. So these are, this is the plan for, for today, but let's start from uh, authentication. Um, so, what is authentication? That's a question for you. What is authentication? What is the meaning of authentication in this context? Yes. be sure that the person who is trying to access our website service whatever is the one that this person say to be okay other definitions identify, the user. identify users just yes it's, it's a summary of that Make sure the permission to access the resource are okay. Okay, and what is authorization instead? Because it's another thing, right? Because one thing is authentication, the other thing is authorization. I'm authorized to access a resource. It's not the same, I'm authenticated on a service that will provide me the resource. Okay. Um, so let's start from that. So authentication is what you have said, uh, the two of you mainly, that is verify in some way that you are who you say you are. So verify your identity in some way. On the web, this is typically done with credentials like username and password. And the purpose of authentication on a web service, on a web application, is to allow a personalized user experience on the application, where personalized means that according to who you are, things can change. You will have access to more uh, button, to more action, to more pages, 
than not as a not authenticated user. And this is what we typically experiment with the sign up process and with login, right? We authenticate in a system and then something happened after we are authenticated. And in most websites, you notice that we have a pre, a, the public website, a public service for non-authenticated user that does a series of things. And then as soon as, you, as soon as you authenticate, you have other things. In some cases, a different uh, user interface, a different web page. That's authentication. Authorization is more what your colleague was saying. That is deciding if you have permission to access a resource. Where the granted authorization depended on the identity that you establish during authentication. So they're often used in conjunction to protect the access of a system, but they are different things. You authenticate on a system to say, okay, I am me, the person who is expected to be, and the fact that I can access some resources or not depends on my level of authorization. So I can log in as a normal user and I will see something in the user in the, in the web application. And then if I log in instead of as the administrator, I will have more authorization right as I can do more things than a normal authenticated user. Both are authenticated, but they are authenticated with different privilege, with different authorization rights. They can do different things, even if both are authenticated. Non-authenticated users are typically non-logged in users. Um, then instead, they can access to all the public resources of a web service, web application, if any. And they are often used in conjunction, again, to protect the access of a system. You sometimes have just authentication if you want to uh, differentiate between non-logged in user or logged in users. And sometimes you add authorization in a web uh, application. And you can also have authorization on the APIs, hmm? just on the server, that is, according to who you are and the role and the permission you have, you can do something different. Hmm? But we are going to use this. They are different, but we are going to merge it together in the concept that we are going to see uh, today. So in the web, what means to develop authentication and authorization mechanism like the one that we are going to, to see? Uh, it means that we need to spend, uh, actually, if you want to do from scratch, uh, you need to think about a lot of things uh, and you need to spend a lot of time and you can do errors, especially security errors, so keeping open things open. And you may want to make decisions like, okay, you want to interact with third party authentication systems like login with Google or login with Facebook or login with whatever. So not deploying or developing only one way to authenticate on a, on a application, but rely on other authentication system. Etc. And all of this is clearly complicated. I need to handle username and password. I need to handle logging with Google. I need to handle logging with Facebook or whatever. I need to handle this and that. And it could be prone to error. And clearly this involves both the client, if we are speaking of a web application, both the client and the server, because they both need to have different level of authentication and authorization, both. So, what we are going to do in this course and what is typically considered a good, a very good practice is to use hmm, standardized process, is to use the best practice that others, especially security experts, had put in place. Hmm? So the login that we're going to see is just that we are going to see is just the same login process that you experience on every probably on every single website that you can experience on the web. There is nothing fancy, there is nothing strange, and it's done on purpose, because since it could be complicated, time consuming, etc., if you can follow, if we can all follow standardized practice and way to do things in a specific way, we are all more uh, sure that things work and work well. So we are not going to, we can, if you want, but we are not going to implement login authentication authorization from scratch 
by hand, but we're going to rely on uh, tools, on frameworks, on library that already implement best practice and standard process to do that. Both, in, especially on the server. Um, so here this table show which are the possible layers of authorization. And what it means. So, for instance, uh, the person using the application can do login, logout, and navigate page. That's the main action that the person can do. The React application can, for instance, check if the person is logged in or not, and check if there is some specific role associated to the person, like I'm is an administrator is a creator, is a viewer, depends on the application, and also should remember the user information because every action can be or cannot be done by specific type of user that you have. And how you can remember the information, whether with state and context variable, and when you can set a state and context variable at the login, you should destroy them at the logout, and you should also try to query and to maintain during the navigation within the app. And then we can go down. The browser needs to remember navigation session. It needs to remember that if you open another tab, you are still logged in. It's not that another tab you have to start from scratch. Uh, the server needs to remember the data that the user logged in and stay logged in for a while until the person, let's say, don't press logout and this needs to be uh, remembered the route will need to verify the validity of this mm? so information is stored in the server but st still valid are still okay mm? at every HTTP request because we have said we have said the other the other week the HTTP request you have a request and response and you don't know what happens before and you will not know what happens after you have a single couple of requests and response Mm? And the next request will not have knowledge of what happened before. So we need to share this knowledge in a way in the server between these requests, this couple of requests and response, etc. Mm? Until the database that needs to store some of the information, for instance, the username of the person that is logged in, whatever is the username, mm? could be the email or a name or whatever, and the password. And also in this case, are we going to put the password, the real password, the clear password in the database to you? No. no. So also in that case, clearly no. Also in that case, we need to find ways to be able to pick the password from the client, convert it some, in some way and store it in the database and be able to retrieve it when the password matches. So we need to cover, to think about all these layers. And that's why I also told you that the, the example, the exercise we're going is pretty complicated because we need to operate in most, we will operate in most of these levels. What happens when the person clicks on something and then what happens in React and then what happens in the server and what happens at the database level. So there are a lot of pieces, standard pieces, but still a lot of pieces that uh, should be taken care of. So we are going. There are many ways to do authentication based on uh, login and password. That's the standard way to do uh, authentication for the web. Um, right now, we are going to see one of them. That is the classical way. That is the one based on session. There are other ways based on tokens that doesn't create a session on the server, but just share tokens between the client and the server, continuously share tokens, tokens that expire and needs to be renewed. So it's more complicated, but we're going to see the session. That is the standard way, the classical way to do uh, authentication with any web application. Hmm? So we are going to introduce two concepts. One is session and one is cookies. What is, what is cookies? in computer science, not in the real world, because... What is a cookie? Uh, cookie is a concept uh, that uh, keeps uh, information on the browser. 
is something that keeps an information on the browser. That's um, the attribute. The type of attribute. What is the type of attribute? Uh, this, uh, this have uh, uh, key and value. Okay, it's and yes. It's it has a series of properties including key values and expired data. This is a bit of information that you store in the browser and according to HTTP and according to HTTP, this is fundamental in our case because we are using cores. According to HTTP, a cookie is sent from a browser to the server only when we are in the same origin, when we are in the same domain. And we are not, because we are using cores. We have the React server running on a domain, and we have the Express server running another domain. So in that case, the cookie will not leave the browser automatically. We will need to take care of telling the browser, send the cookie now, because we need the cookie. And we're going to use the cookie to keep the session alive between the server and the client. What is a session? Also, the cookie are those things that you see a lot of banners on the website. And you have press yes, I agree. Um, sessions. Okay, in this context, it's a period in where we know that a person is authenticated on a service. And why we need session? Why we need to introduce this concept and this, uh, and the technical implication of this concept? Why HTTP is not enough to keep a period and the related information in that period? What is stateless? Because HTTP is stateless, so we again we don't know uh, what happens in the previous request. We cannot access to the previous request or previous response, so we need a way. When we log in, we will send a request. Please log me in, and the server reply, okay, done. And then the next request will need to know that we are logged in or not. And so this bit of information since HTTP stateless cannot be made permanent between the server and the, and, the, and the client, so we need to introduce something that is session to keep this information somewhere, hmm? to know that we have this information. So, as he was saying, HTTP is stateless, but we may need to keep information between different interaction, between different pages, between different requests. Not only for login, clearly for login, but also like written here, if you have a shopping cart in a website and you put something in the shopping cart and then you change page, you don't want that that item in the, in the, in the, in the shopping cart is lost. You want the, in the new page still to access to the shopping cart that you have. That's what you all done, we all done on Amazon and other websites. The shopping cart remains across multiple pages. In some cases, also across multiple. If we close the browser and reopen it again, you will see it again. Fill out. Hmm? So this state of our full interaction across pages in the application is what we uh, call session and what we need to have remembered to navigate through the website. So, uh, more formally, a session is a temporary and interactive data interchanged between two or more parties. And in the web, it's typically data interchange between a client, a browser, and a server. Uh, clearly, it involves one or more messages in each direction, and often, not always, but often, one of the party keep this full state of the application. And in our case, who is the keep the full state of this session? The client or the server? To you? One. The server hmm, will keep the state in this case because the server has visibility. 
you can open three browsers if you want going to the same server and that and if you log in the same way to the browser he, he the, the server needs to know um, and a session is temporary so it's established a certain point in case of login when you do login successfully and it's send it at some later point for instance when you do log out uh, and the basic mechanism so session is not really complicated it's just data interchanged and stored somewhere in the server but the basic mechanism to maintain a session is the session id mm, that is just an identifier alphanumeric typically that in our case upon authentication the client receive this session id from the server so you logged in successfully logged in in the response you receive the session id and session id allow the server to recognize that subsequent HTTP requests are authenticated according to that session ID. And this session ID clearly must be stored on the client side, must be sent by the client a table request that is part of the session, and must not be sensitive, hmm? cannot be the email, hmm? must be an ID. And here we have the other elements of this uh, recipe, that is that session is the is typically stored in and sent as cookies. Mm? So this communication with session ID happens through cookies in a session-based mechanism. And cookies are a small portion of information stored in the browser. The browser is a series of storage, storages. There is a cookie storage. There is a local storage that is sort of a small database and a session storage, etc. And the cookies are stored in the cookie storage. And as we were saying before, they are automatically handled by browsers and sent by browsers automatically when performing a request to the same domain and path. Hmm? That is not what happened in our case, because again, we have a different domain and path hmm? because we are using course. And you can use cookies also to store other kind of information, but it's always important to never store sensitive information in a cookie because cookies are easily uh, accessed by browser and by default are sent to any server on the same domain and path. So it's, it's never a good idea to keep sensitive information because other people can access that cookie. So cookies are a series of attributes, as your colleagues were saying, some of them are mandatory, some are best practice, some are not mandatory. Uh, so clearly you have a name of the cookie, that could be session ID, and the value that contain the cookie, like that nine, four dollar, etc. Hmm? And this is mandatory. Then you have other attributes that are important, that is secure. Hmm? And if set is not mandatory, but if set means that the cookie will be sent to the server only if the, connection, if the connection is HTTPS. Hmm? So we are not going to set secure in the cookie because we don't have an HTTP connection between the client and the server, but if you have, it's always better to have secure set in the cookie. Uh, another property that we are going to set instead is HTTP only. That means that the cookie in the browser will be not accessible by JavaScript will be just be sent, the content of the cookie will not be accessible, hmm? but only from HTTP requests, so only sent as is, as is on the on server and received back to be stored. Hmm? But you cannot manipulate the content of the cookie from the JavaScript running in the browser. And then you have another attribute that takes expiration dates, cookies can, can expire at a certain time in, in the future. So how a uh, session-based authentication work? Hmm? So we have a browser, let's say our React application that's run in the browser, and we have our Express application. So when we want to do login, what happens happens that the browser typically send a post request to a specific endpoint 
in the server, passing the information needed for login, let's say username and password. The server receive it, check it, if everything is fine, if this correct username, the correct password, send back up authenticated. If not, send back an er a message of error. But let's say that everything is correct. When everything is correct, check this information, the username and the password, they are both good. So the server in that case, save the session data. So create a session in a session storage on the server in Express with some information about the user. Which information should the servers save to you? Well, surely it will save the session ID, create a session ID and store the session ID, saying, okay, this user logged in in this moment is associated with the session ID 1234. And then you can also store other information related to the user, which could be, for instance, Date or IP? The These are not information related to the user. The role. the role of the user, if the user are role. The name, if the user has a name and you're interested. So information in session storage could be as many as you want. Typically, the session storage contains a little of information. Uh, but these are the information that are available in the server without querying a database or other doing other queries. So if you need to know the role immediately, because according to the role of the user, administrator or not administrator, you will do something different. That's a good thing to store in the session because it's immediately available as soon as you receive an HTTP request. And if you need the name of the user in every request or in most of the requests, then it's another kind of information that you, you can store. You surely don't store the password in the session, because this is not an information that you want to pass and move around too often, or often, or ever, actually. Hmm? So the browser receives the login. In some way, store, create a session ID and store some information in the storage. It's up to you, it's up to application that you need to do. And in the HTTP response, the server attach a cookie. And in this cookie, there is the session ID. The browser received the HTTP response, 200 OK or 201 created, whatever. See that the response is a cookie and store the cookie in the cookie storage. And it's done automatically. Then at a certain point in time, let's imagine that you have to do a request for some information. Let's say the list of your exam, the list of the exam for the authenticated user that will be different list according to who is the person. Then the client in the GET request, that will be the same GET request that you have even uh, for a non-authenticated user, like the questions, mm, the GET for all the questions we did in the class, will also send, in this case, the cookie with the session ID that he received, that the client received in the past from the server. The server receives the HTTP request, see that there is a cookie, and check the session ID in the cookie. If the session ID is valid, is one of the session ID that uh, he has, that the server has, then will reply correctly with the list of the exam associated to the um, user that is associated with that session ID. Otherwise, we'll uh, give an error, we we'll say not authorized, etc. Hmm? Typically, we we'll say 401 unauthorized. And in checking the session ID from the cookie, it will first of all retrieve session data hmm? stored in the session storage. And since in this case it's asking for a list of exams, it will also well, query the database to get a list of exams and prepare a JSON file to send back to the server, to the client. But what happens, uh, since the uh, cookie is sent back to the browser, uh, does it mean that 
the browser can also access the cookies or modify it in some ways? Yes, it could. So one practice is to set the cookie as HTTP only so that there is no, no one that can change the cookie. Well, if you open probably the cookie session and manually change the cookie, you can change it clearly. But if you have this uh, property, this attribute set out, set out, there is no way that any JavaScript code running in the browser will be able to change the cookie and html and css is not able to to change anything uh, so only javascript is the programming language that is could be able to change the cookie but if you set http only that's prevented so we need to always have the http only set otherwise anyone can just access another session yes we will have so by default in the in the, in the library we're going to use, uh, we, it will um, set up HTTP only on by default. So yes, but HTTP only is, is something that you want to set, uh, if it's not set, um, because it makes it inaccessible to JavaScript. Then, clearly, you can, you know, uh, let's say that you forget to, to enable HTTP only, and you replace the session ID with another thing. This another thing should still be one of the session ID that the server knows. So you, you can replace it with that. You should, if you want to do this uh, malevolent section, you should replace it with a session ID that exists. Cannot be any random number, because otherwise the server will say, you're not authorized. And so you broke the system, but you didn't gain any advantage from changing the cookie. Okay. Okay. So this is how session work. This is what we are going to do also in React. We will have a React that we filling a form. We send a JSON with username and password, and Express that will create a session and send back the cookie set with all this property that we discussed. And then at a certain point, when we have a request for which we are interested to have the cookie, we will uh, to have the authenticated user it could be all the requests or be some requests it depends on the application uh, we will be sure to have the cookie and the server will process it and provide the, the right answer to our request is this clear hmm? okay so just a small note about let's say, security uh, when possible um, that means outside of this course always use https and secure cookies in production we are not going to use https and so we cannot use secure cookies but if you have an https uh, connection then use secure cookies so that even the session is sent in an encrypted way uh, but in any case use http only cookies uh, we are going to do as a reminder, never store sensitive information to cookies. And for what, for what concern, especially for what concern authentication, it's always best to rely on best practice and avoiding to reinvent the well for authentication. Because there are many things you've seen that going on here, and there are many things that can go wrong under many perspectives. So relying on best practice, or again, relying on standardized procedure will help you to create a consistent and secure mm, way to proceed for authentication and here for instance mention a few attacks just mention it uh, that are related to authentication mm. so for instance there is the cross-site request forgery or the cross-site scripting etc mm. so most of these can be prevented by using this standardized and best practice so the, the framework that we use, uh, by default, uh, prevent hmm, some of this attack. So you don't have to do anything because it's the developer who created the framework and the library that already coded them to be sure to avoid common security issues. But if you do it from scratch, you have to also to think about this uh, kind of attacks that we are not going to, to see clearly in these three hours, but 
there are possible things that can go wrong in the authentication phase. So, in practice, what means for us doing authentication? Well, let's start from the base login flow. Hmm? So, what happens when you do a login on any service on any website? So, first of all, you have the person filling out the form with the username and password. And the username, I continue to call it username, is actually a unique user identifier. It could be, again, what, what, anything. It could be the email, it could be uh, a string. It should be unique. It should be an identifier hmm? for the specific person, independently of what it is. Hmm? So the person sent created the form. Data in the form is validated. You know, the password should contain, should be long at least six character and contains one capital letter, one not capital letter, one number, one special character, the name of a caller, etc. So data is validated. If the validation is okay, it's sent to the server with a POST API, with a POST request. Why with a POST request and not with a GET? Yes, that is a philosophical reason. The more practical reason, that's correct. But why we don't we need to send? So we said the post is more appropriate. But what's the difference between sending data with a post or with a get? We have a body. Mm? In the post, you have a body. The content of the the form is sent in JSON, let's say, to a body. In a get, will be sent, will be visible in the URL in the browser. So you you will see the password. Everybody will see the password because it's written in the URL. So it's not something that you want to do. So with a POST API. Hmm? Here with mo one more reason. Uh, so the server, in that case, received the request, check whether the user is registered. Hmm? So if there is already a unique identifier and a password associated to that unique identifier, and if the password stored matches with the password sent, and password comparison exploit cryptographical hashes, typically, and in our case also. And if not, if the user is not registered, if the password doesn't match, etc., send back a response to the client saying wrong username and password. Why wrong username and password and not wrong username or wrong password? Because otherwise we give information to... Because otherwise we give information that is actually useful for the, the user to know I, I am logged in, I'm registered, but I just forget the password. But also for, again, more security purpose, we give this information to uh, attackers that they get the right username and now they need to change the password. Only to focus on the password. Instead, if we don't say anything, username or password, they don't know. Maybe the username is right, but they don't know. So they need to check that the area of attack is wider. Mm. So always this generic answer, wrong username or password. If the username and password are correct, the server generates a session ID. The server stores the session ID together with some user info in the, ser in the server session storage, reply with HTTP, uh, reply with, with HTTP response, with the uh, name of the cookie with a cookie that says as a name session id as the value the value of the generated session id http only true secure hopefully true if we are over https the browser received the response with a cookie that automatically is stored by the browser and the response is handled by the web application saying welcome name of the user and from that moment on you are logged in so let's start from the login form and then we, we are also look at this in, the, in React in the exercise. So first of all, you need the login form hmm? with username and password, with whatever you need and you need to do a post request to, um, to the server to get the, to send the information. And this is easy. It's a controlled form as many other forms we did up to now, just with two fields, username and password. And here there is the rest of the form, clearly. So this is the uh, endo submit event. 
that prevents the fold, validate the form, and do the actual login with the username and password provided. And this is on React. And then we need to move it on server because React will, well, do a post request as any other post request we have done up to now. Nothing strange. And send the username and password, whatever is the username and the password, to the server that will receive a post request in a route. But since all these things for creating session, generating a session ID, etc., must happen, we also need something on the server that support us in doing all these changes, in doing all these operations, like setting the cookie with the right attributes. And we are going to use one middleware for Express, that's also a library, but a middleware in this case, for user authentication and partial authorization in Express, as is called Passport. And you can install it as any other NPM packages. Um, it has a website with very little documentation. So, unfortunately, but it's widely used. So in these slides, you will find more documentation than in the actual documentation, just to say. And so don't, don't look a lot on the website, look on these slides because it's, they're more complete, actually. Um, but password is widely used in the JavaScript world for the server because it's flexible and it's modular. And means, modular means that it supports more than 500 different strategies for authentication, of which username and password is one. But it allows you to attach to any, any I would say, possible uh, authentication strategy you can think of, including login with Google, login with Facebook that we mentioned before. And it's also able to adapt to different type of database, SQL and NoSQL, and clearly adopt some best practice, especially from security purpose, under hood. So for instance, the cookie is always created with HTTP only. And passport allow us to have session-based authentication, but also non-session-based authentication. It's part of these 500 authentication strategies. And this is also part of why it is widely popular despite the lack of documentation in the website. And we are going to use this. So password, before receiving a post request for login, needs to be configured. Needs to be con configured telling password which kind of authentication strategy we are going to use. Username and password, for instance. Uh, if we want a session or not. If we want to personalize something, like again, having a session or not. And then we also need to decide which information go in the session storage. Because that is a responsibility of the developer telling, okay, in the session storage, put the name of the user, put the email of the user, put the role of the user, which kind of information you want to put in the session storage. So first step is to personalize to configure it, password after uh, install it. So the first things that we need to do is to create, to tell password which strategy we want to use. And we are going to use the username and password strategy hmm? that, pass that um, passport call local strategy. Hmm? That is normal authentication with username and password. So you need to import Passport, you need to import Passport local, hmm? that's already available within Passport. And then you have to set up, hmm? similarly to what we did uh, uh, for, um, for other middlewares, hmm? set up what this local strategy means for us. So once we receive username and password, what we need to do with username and password. And this local strategy, so passport.use is setting up the middleware. This um, local strategy has a callback that has three parameters. 
one is username the other one is password and the other one is callback and the goal of this function is to tell a uh, passport what you what to do to verify or to find this information so where this information is stored in the database so you will need to query the database and what happens if they are not found which is the message you go back incorrect username and password in which language etc so this verify function and it's it must be in this way uh, typically the things that, that it does is that check if the database get the user from the database passing username and password and if the user exists then we'll uh, proceed with the rest of the execution otherwise we'll give the message incorrect username and password hmm? and how we proceed or we send the message of incorrect we proceed to send the message using this callback that is the third parameter of the function whatever you want to call it is a callback at a certain point it will become cb and in the doc documentation is called cb but cb stands for callback um, this callback is go to the next hmm, middleware go to the next stage whatever it is and send this information and bring this information with you so in case everything is fine you just need to send new as first parameter and let's say the information about the user a second parameter the fact that the user is exist and you get it from the database and if it's uh, incorrect instead you can have null as first parameter false or anything else because you don't have a user and then as a third parameter you can specify a message otherwise it will use a default message that in this case could be in json format in sort of a json format so where password passport get the username and password so these are getted from the body of the request that receives for login so it automatically struct you don't have to do request.body.password request.body.username but passport immediately get this and look for username and password not email and password so in the json that passport receive you must write the first key username and the second key password you cannot call it another way or you can but you need to add more configuration so let's say that you you don't want to hmm? get information from there check the validity as you prefer in the database and the callback uh, is the one that communicate the results and these are four possible uh, state in this callback in which the valid credential are null users the invalid credential are null false in which you can add also message if you want and instead a callback with the first parameter immediately an error it's an application error so it's not wrong credential it's just we have an error in the server in the database so a different kind of error it's not everything is fine but the password is wrong it's just everything is not working so that's a way to send a stronger error and the user the object here is any object containing information about the current user again the one that you will probably need to store in the uh, in session or the one that you will need to send back to the client to say welcome name of the user and so it's up to you what you decide to do and that user information but it should be an object with some user information in it so that's the first part setting up the lo local strategy uh, and in the local strategy you query the database to check username and password clearly we are not going nobody should store password in plain text in, in the database but we should always perform some kind of hashing of the password so that nobody can retrieve exactly the password hmm? because hashing is a one-way function so you can generate you can check if the hash are the same the generated hash are similar the same family correspond to the same original text 
but you cannot start from a Nash and go back to the text. And there are many hashing um, logger algorithms. Uh, we are going to use a script that is already included in Node, so there is nothing to install, just to use it. And it's a secure password hashing function that you can immediately use and generate hash like this. So this is the hash of password, of the name password. And you can test it, you can generate uh, different hash from a website. So we, don't, we won't have the um, registration phase, that is the one who created the hash, so, because it's nothing really complicated to do, but it's more work in addition to login, so we skip that part, and in the database, if you, want, if you have to provide a password, you can generate a password from a website, like this and put it directly in the database and so that you can retrieve it at the login phase so a script how it works a script has two main function one is to hash a password that is crypto dot a script crypto is the module that contains a script the node modules that contains a script and has various properties the password to be hashed for the salt there should be a random number at least 16 bytes long and crypto as a way to generate this that is this one random bytes uh key LAN is the length of the hash you want to obtain could be 32 or 64 um, character length and then you have a callback to handle errors etc during the hashing process that hopefully you don't have errors and then give you also the hashed password in it so this is the hashed password that you obtain from the process and the one that you can store in the database and this is to hash a password but there is also a way to check if a given password a given textual password matches one of the stored hash that is this timing timing safe equal in which you put the Two password one is the hash password and the other one is the plain password sorry one is the stored password the hashed stored password and the other one is the hash password of the password that you just received mm? so it compares to hashes and if they are equal in some sense then this function will return true and so you are sure that the new password, that the password you inserted in the login form is the one that corresponds to the hash in the database. Hmm? Otherwise, it's the wrong password. And the passwords, all, both passwords must be hashed with the same salt that will be stored in the database as well. Hmm? Because otherwise the hash will never correspond. And here there is the code to do these things in um, in express with um, sqlite and a sql database like in our case mm -hmm. so you can for instance that is the get user this is the get user methods of before to get user information you can select everything from users where email in this case the email is the username uh, is equal to the one passed here uh, you get the email, everything is fine, you put in the user the ID of the user and the email and you create a salt, you generate the hash from the password you received and you check if the password, the hash version of the password you received correspond to the password stored in the database, retrieved from the database. If they uh, correspond you resolve the promise you fulfill the promise with the user otherwise you fulfill the promise with false hmm? saying that the password doesn't uh, aren't the same so this is for local strategy to checking the password and this is a middleware at the beginning of the express server then you may want to have additional middlewares for password for passport and 
One of these is the session, because Passport support, as I said before, session and also non-session, so we want to enable sessions. And we have to install another module that's called Express Session that enables sessions, that enable all the mechanism that was uh, shown in the picture before. Uh, and to enable session, you just need uh, a secret. That is a secret phase of your choice that we use to generate the session IDs. And by default, uh, Express Session store the session in memory. Hmm? Not on file, not on database, but in memory. That is what we're going to use in the course. That is clearly something not to use in production because it's not efficient if you have many users logged in keeping everything in memory uh, but express sessions support also other way of storing the session on file or in the sqlite database that you use mm? so it has also in this case modularity to uh, flexibility options to store the session wherever you want we will use the default to not make more things more complicated of what they already are and we store we keep the default to storing the session in memory that means that if you for any reason don't log out but you log in and keep the server running the session will be still available because the server the session will stay available until it is in memory or destroyed mm -hmm. so you the, the way to delete a session is to just do log out <laughs> or stop the server because you clean the memory. And here, this is a middleware, so app use, that's the way to define all middlewares at app level in Express and then pass the middleware you want to use, that in this case is authenticate through session. And here there are some options. The, the only required one is um, secret. You can specify store, I was saying. If you don't specify, you get the memory store by default, but you can specify any other store if needed. Um, there is an option that is resave, uh, that is mentioned here together with save, unutilized, and is also reported here uh, because you need to set both to false because they have a default value that is true but according to passport documentation, the default value is deprecated, and so you shouldn't use it. And so you need to overwrite the default value and set it to false. Hmm? And here there is an explanation what they do. Hmm? So resave force the shared session to be saved back to the session store, uh, even if the session was never modified, and it's better to, to do this. And the other one force a session that is new but not modified to be stored, to be saved on the store whatever is the store so the recommendation of passport is to set these both to false again even if the default is true and they say that the default is deprecated and then you have username and password you have the information about the user you created a session and now you have to personalize the session what you put in the session storage which information you put in the session storage and Passport do this through two functions. One is serialize user and one is deserialize user. Hmm? That is a way to write in the session storage and get information from the session storage. And deciding which information are in the session storage. So serialize user is which information from the user, the role, the name, you want to serialize into the session storage, you want to put in the session storage. Hmm? And again, it's a subset of the available user info. And these are stored internally in this object, rec.session.passport. That is the passport internal mechanism to keep track of things. Mm? So the serialized user is automatically called by passport. Get the user object and a callback, the same callback as before, in which you just decide that the first parameter is null because the first parameter is for big application errors and the second parameter in this case is a javascript object that represents the information you want to put in the session storage just the information you want to put in session storage that should be available in the user for instance or can be retrieved hmm, from the database if you don't have it from the login for whatever reason 
And this is the way to store things in the session storage. When Express receive a subsequent request of an authenticated request, it will get information from the session storage and will get information from the session storage through the deserialized user method that has the same callback as before. First parameter user, second parameter callback, and the callback work as before. And the second parameter is the object you memorized in the session. So all the requests to server will eat this function, all the authorized, authenticated requests to the server will eat this function. And this object user created here, filled out here, will be available to every authenticated route in the request. So if you need to get information about the user from the session, you already have there, available to all the route in the request as rec.user. Rec.user contains the user information you put in the session. So if you need the role of the user, you just have there. You don't need to query the database to get that. You already have this information in the session if you put it, and in all the authenticated requests, you have this object user available so that you can use it hmm, to get the information you want. And at this point, hmm, you can, in the route for login, tell to the route of login that it should use passport and the local strategy for authenticated. So the post request sent from the um, from the React application, we'll reach this app.post, that is normal app.post, with the uh, URL and the request response. And it will have a, a middleware in the middle, that is passport.authenticate local, that say to passport to use everything you configured up to the point. So to use uh, the local strategy for querying the database, to use the serialize and the serialize function to get and, and write information in the, so in the session storage, etc. And here, hmm, you can, for instance, get the username, if you want to say, or the name of the user, if you want to say, welcome name of the user that just logged in, in the React application. So you can just go back with the rest.json, this is normal express, and you can get from rec.user, that again, is the object created automatically for every authenticated request and get the information you have from there. And these are the information, again, that you stored in the session. And this is the server. Hmm? And for every authentication you will do, this is the things you need to do, basically. Where things can change a little bit is in React. Because in React, at a certain point, you will receive this user information, let's say the username that is coming back from here. Hmm? So from here, you'll just say, will you go back to with the username in a JSON file, and you can get a username, and maybe you want to store the username for later usage. Hmm? So where do you want to store, to store it? You can store it in a state. You can store it in a context. and one thing, and then always have something like api.getUserInfo in a user fact to ask the server for the user information and to verify if the login is still valid, is still the session is still active or not, from React application to, to the server. Because again, if you close the React application and you reopen it, you will lose the state, you will lose the context. So the first things you may want to do is to ask the server, I am still logged in. Is this browser still have a cookie with a session ID that is valid? If yes, I want to be logged in already. I don't want to insert username and password again and create another session. I want to reuse the session that exists. So this API that gets user info is a way to get this information when needed. And the suggestion is to put it in a user fact so that when you start the React application, you first thing check if you are logged in. And if you are logged in, you change 
field state, change everything so that you have the user information available, the user information that you need available, if, you, if, if any, and everything is logged in so you behave as a logged in application. If you're not logged in, the user fact, this function will return false, will return no uh, information, so you don't set the logged in state and you can continue with the unlogged application as you want, as you prefer. So this is the login. Then we have other two small pieces. One is the logout and one is what happens after the login. Mm? So after the login, some routes on the server needs to be protected. Because if you say that only authorized users can get the list of questions or only logged in user can vote, you should enforce this on the server telling that that only authenticated user can do this operation, can access to this route. These routes are not public anymore, it will be protected, hmm? because only some role can access this. Hmm? So, we have two problems to protect, we have to do two things to protect routes in our case. Uh, the first one is the problem with cookies. We said that cookies are sent by the browser by default automatically to the same domain and port. And we are using cores and we are not in the same domain and port. The React server is not in the same domain and port of the Express server. So we need to tell cores that we need to accept cookies from other domains. And we do this in two ways, in two parts, in the server we are going to add to the course option credential true that will inform the server that the cookie received is something to be considered for authentication and i've seen that in the solution of the labs you already have this line so in the solution of the labs if you start from the solution of the labs you already have course configured correctly uh, we didn't in the class up to now and then in the request we need also to tell react that the browser needs to send the cookie and we do this by adding to any protected hmm, uh, request to any request to protect it route a uh, object hmm, that is credential include this will tell the browser to pick the cookie and associate it to this domain and port and send it with the request. So the default behavior if we were in the same server, in the same domain and port. Hmm? But we are not in the same domain and so we need to specify this. And importantly, the login request must include such option. So even if the login request doesn't have a cookie to send, because there is no session in place for how it works course you must include such option since the beginning of the login session hmm? uh, from how fetch and course works so the login session the login request should have credential includes so that any other request can access can see the cookie and send it hmm? so the login request must have the credential includes option right in the fetch even if there is no cookie to send in that moment otherwise the rest is not working and then when we are sure that we sent the cookie and the server received the cookie we must protect the routes on the server and we can protect the routes with a middleware that is a rec dot is authenticated so you can write app.post or app.get open parenthesis slash api slash questions comma rec dot is authenticated comma something else mm, the callback or you can use if rec is authenticated in the body of the route to protect the route so this is authenticated will return true if the user is valid mm, is authenticated if the session is valid if the fashion is enabled if the cookie received from the client from this specific route is the right one and is one of the ones stored in session storage etc 
um, this is the default way if you want more personalization like sending back a message that you prefer when the um, is authenticated is false you can create a middleware like this and in the solution there is exactly this middleware that is is logged in they just check if it's authenticated and in case of error we we'll say 400 not authenticated and this is a middleware you can use in any route you want hmm? without repeating every time if rack is authenticated then do this then do that and this could be either application level if you have all the routes that must be protected that is most of the case not what you have or at the route level as a middleware hmm? um, like this that is instead what you typically want to do hmm? again this is to protect the route also to say that this route this uh, api is accessible only if you are authenticated and then here you can also check other values of authorization like is the role the right one and finally the logout so the last piece is the logout the logout will be another post request let's say post a logout to um, from the browser to the server and this this will call rec.logout rec.logout and uh, rec.logout will again is a method that passport insert in the request and will destroy the session in the server and so the user is logged out very very simple and notice this this way of writing this is the recommended way of writing in also from password rec.logout and in the callback you send response.end because this is a post request and you need to provide a response anyway hmm? this is an http request you need to provide a response and these are all the pieces you need for doing login keeping the authentication the application authorized and doing the logout okay so now we're going to do a break um, clearly and then we are going to see in the project in the exercise that is already done on github so you can download it also i suggest you to download it so that you can see it together with me and we go through this part piece to piece one step by step uh, and also he, in the exodus there is the integration with react so there is a login button a logout button and checks that if you are not logged in you cannot do some things in react that are things that is missing in these slides okay 20 minutes break and then we'll restart at uh, 10 10.